rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name, in the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious, you are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Unmatched in all your wisdom, in love and justice you will reign, and every knee will bow. We bring our expectations, our hope is anchored in your name, in the name of Jesus. We trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever. Forevermore, you are victorious. We lift our banner high. We lift the name of Jesus. From age to age, you reign. Your kingdom has no end. of Jesus from age to age you reign your kingdom has no end you are the only king forever almighty God we lift you higher you are the only king forever forevermore you are victorious you are the only king forever almighty God we lift you higher you are the only king forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Amen. That's a great way to start the week, isn't it? To start the week. Praise the Lord. Hey, can you do me a favor? I don't, we're not shaking hands yet, are we? We're kind of shaking hands, not kind of shaking hands. Can we greet each other from a distance? Can you just look around and go, hey, hey, how are you? Good to see you this morning. Point, wave, don't blow a kiss, not advised. If you're near the camera, look back, point, wave. All right, you can have a seat for a moment. Go ahead and have a seat. Good morning, everybody. Hey, I want to welcome anybody that is uh, visiting with us for the first time. We'd love to know that you were here and what brought you here. Um, we have a contact card in the back of the pews, so if you would grab that, take a look at it. Uh, if you decide to fill it out on this visit, uh, fold it in half, put it in one of the offering boxes in the back of the sanctuary. Uh, if you are a regular attender, uh, you can also use this contact card as well. If you look at the back of it, there's some questions. Maybe something's changed for you. Uh, you want to take another step in your faith. Or if you have a prayer request, write that on here. Fold it in half and put it in the offering box. All right. Continuing on with announcements, I would like to show you a short video. Is it not 
scare you at all to be a parent? Nope. Mm. Okay, maybe a little bit. We got this thing outnumbered. It's two grown-ups against one little bitty baby. We got this. Ronnie. His name is Ronnie. When it comes to raising kids, the days are long, but the years are short. It's short enough, if you ask me. Tonight, we need to talk about Kate. She was, I guess, hitting other kids in church yesterday. Okay, we'll talk about it. Great. I'm so glad you're interested in your kids' lives. Honey, the only reason that Kate is still here is because she is too young to leave. You know what? This is going nowhere. Sit down! Just leave me alone! And she's falling right after Ronnie. Look me up sometime. Bye, Mom. We have two more coming up after her. She's not your real mom anyway. Your real mom couldn't handle you. And they're gonna follow right after her. Honey, we have got to get help. Our kids aren't the problem. It's us, man. You can't run around living life one day at a time. You gotta know where you're going. And then lead. Here we go. That will be your legacy. No legacy of faithful love. We just have to remember, our job is to be faithful. Change is up to God. All right, if you have plans this evening, please consider canceling them. Uh, we're going to show that movie right here. Uh, we'll meet here at 4.30. The movie will start very shortly after that. Uh, this will be the third time I've seen it, and I'm looking forward to it. I, I love the way it spans the, the time of our kids. Um, if you have, parent, uh, have parents, you obviously have parents, or have had parents at some point in time. <laughs> Lord help me. <laughs> you have children. <laughs> Thanks, Ken, for that laugh support. I felt that right there. Um, this is a great movie. Uh, we have to keep transitioning through our kids as they grow and mature, and we parent them. As long as they're alive and we're alive, at some level, we're still the mom, still the dad, and we need to support them in whatever way they need. And so what I like that about this movie, too, is it spans that. And, uh, and some of us hurt, hit certain phases. We're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I, <laughs> I don't think it's going well. And so this is an opportunity for us to... Uh, Enjoy a movie. Uh, it will be a kickoff to a parenting class. So if you're interested at all in the parenting class at right now or, or after the movie, uh, you'll have an opportunity to express that and maybe get on board and get with some other parents and say, do you know what you're doing? I don't know what I'm doing. Are you doing what you're doing? Sometimes. Um, and then you guys can kind of figure that out together with a, a great couple. How about that? Ken, was that a good plug? All right, thank you. Hey, applause from the front row. Awana, you guys are almost done. What's happening here? <laughs> oh, sorry, was that too loud? Um, you've got Awana Tuesday night, and the week after that, awards? Oh, my goodness. So, hey, let's be praying for them. Uh, we want that team to finish well, do we not? And so let's pray for strength and energy and love, uh, as we would any Tuesday night, but especially coming, coming soon here. Um, Easter. How about it? Uh, Easter morning, we're going to have a pancake breakfast before the worship service starting at 830. So uh, cancel your plans with your pillow. All right. Am I missing anything? All right. I'm going to pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we got a chance to gather this morning. Thank you, Lord. We had the freedom to come. We had the freedom to stay home. We had the freedom to go elsewhere. Lord, and we chose to come here. We, we chose to get online. We chose to worship together with other believers and lift you up. We pray, Father, that you would bless us for that. Please bless us for the choice that we made this morning. 
Receive our ministry as we sing your praise, and please minister to us, Lord. You know we need it, and you know exactly in what ways we need it. Lord, I thank you, God, that you are bigger and you're greater than anything that I could be dealing with. Anything that happened this week, anything that's going to happen next week, this next month, you're greater, you're bigger. The most important relationship that I could have is with you, God. I pray, Lord, that you would stir that in my heart and remind me of that. Yours is the greatest, greatest relationship. Draw us close to you, Lord, please. Draw us close to you during this time. We ask for this in Jesus' name, amen. Just a reminder, too, today is a Communion Sunday, and so for those that are worshiping with us online, uh, at some point, take a moment and uh, find something to represent the bread, so find something to represent the blood. my lips 
here I am. Take the cold, cleanse my lips, here I am. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time that we could gather and praise your name. Lord, as we take time to hear from Brian, one of our deacons, share with us, Lord, and prepare our hearts for communion. Do that, Jack. Do that, Lord. Do that, Dad. I pray. Prepare our hearts to receive communion. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Welcome everyone online. Uh, thank you, Pastor Sam, for this opportunity this morning. Um, many of you guys know I'm a adrenaline junkie with my mountain biking and uh, my skiing. But this is on the next level right here. This is uh, way out of my comfort zone, so I ask you to bear with me this morning. Um, but. We get to come this morning and glorify God, so isn't that amazing? Um, <clears throat> what is communion? Uh, communion is a time of remembrance of the body and blood of Jesus Christ that was broken and poured out on the cross. It reminds us to be thankful to the Father for our Son Jesus. It reminds us to gather as a church the body of Christ, fellowship with Jesus, and God the Father. It reminds us to be thankful for the spiritual life Jesus freely gives to us because he gets to live in our hearts. It reminds us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2 through 3 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Communion also reminds us of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we can joyfully proclaim his death until his return. Now we're all ready for that. It helps us to remember the sacrifice and immense suffering Jesus endured on the cross by dying so that we might be saved. It reminds us of the immeasurable love God has for us. And he loves us a lot. That's pretty amazing. And a really important thing is communion brings glory to God. Psalm 115.1 says, Not to us, O oh Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness, because he is faithful. I'm going to ask you to pray with me real quick. Dear Father God, we just thank you for this beautiful Sunday. Thank you for this time of remembrance, this time of fellowship. Thank you for your son Jesus. Thank you for the love that you share with us, the faith that you have, Lord, the promises you keep. We thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross, being your only son, Lord, and him dying to save us. And we're just not worthy of that, but you did it anyways. And we just thank you so much for that. We pray, Lord, for those that are here and those that aren't really able to be with us this morning. Uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would just bless them this week. Help them to praise you, not just on Communion Sunday, but every day, Lord. We, we want to look to you always. Focus our eyes upon you and just give you the glory and praise that you deserve and that we'd always be reminded of being thankful to you. 
Just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Are you a believer? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You don't need to be a member of this church to be able to come down here this morning and partake in the elements, but I just welcome everyone uh, to be able to do that. Um, there will be two cups. They're stacked on top of each other. Uh, the, the bread is underneath. I was reminded this morning that uh, the wafers, I guess we ran out of them. So there's crackers in there and maybe some crumbs. So please don't choke. I don't want anybody choking this morning. Um, in a minute, I'll invite you down. Um, we'll grab the cups, return to our seats, and then uh, we'll partake in the elements together. But first, I have a little story, just real quick. Uh, it was many years ago. Uh, I was sitting in the back, like we apparently always do. Um, Pastor Mark was presiding over communion, and he asked us to pray with our families, pray with our friends and loved ones, and just pray out loud if you'd like to. Um, but I remember doing that. Kendra was sitting on my lap. Sam was sitting next to me. And, and I think that may have been the first time that either one of them had heard me pray for them out loud. And uh, I always do it, but it's always kind of in silence and never directed to them. And that, at that time, it was kind of directed to them, uh, praying to Jesus and God the Father that they were my children, and I got to enjoy that time with them. So what I'm going to ask you to do is come down and get the elements, and then if you'd like, go back in your seats and, and pray with your family. Uh, pray with your kids, pray with your loved ones, pray with a friend. Uh, do it six feet apart, apparently. We're still doing that, but, but do that. Uh, pray for each other and give thanks to God. Um, take a couple minutes, but <clears throat> pray out loud if you can or if you'd like to. If you don't, it's fine. I'd like to ask you to come down right now and grab the, the like I said, one cup. That's, they're stacked on top of each other, so you're welcome to come down.
to pick my Bible up because I can't read and my eyes are, everything's so small, I need to get bigger print. Anyways, 1 Corinthians 11, 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this whenever you drink in remembrance of me. Thank you. times I fail still your mercy remains and should I stumble again still I'm caught in your grace everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all Of all else, my purpose remains. The art of losing myself in bringing you praise everlasting. Your light will shine when all. in my soul Lord I give you control consume me from the inside out let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out everlasting your light will shine when all else fades Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the end. Sigh out, Lord, my soul cries out. in my soul Lord I give you control consume me from the inside out let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out everlasting your light will shine when all else fades Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame. And the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the end. Sigh out, Lord, my soul cries out everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades. Never ending, your glory goes beyond all fame and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the inside out 
my Lord, my soul cries out from the end. Sigh out, Lord, my soul cries out. Amen.
his feet and rise to reign eternally in a grace so glorious. Oh, in a grace so glorious. Counted glory to glory, worthy is the Lord of all the glory forever. Holy is the Lord, crowned in glory to glory. Worthy is the Lord of all the glory forever. Holy is, sing crowned in glory, crowned in glory to glory. Worthy is the Lord of all the glory forever. Holy is the Lord, crowned in glory to glory. Worthy is the Lord of all the glory forever. Holy is the Lord. Oh, Lord, the praise belongs to you. All the praise belongs to you. Thank you for wanting us to sing to you. Whether other people sing, think we sing well or not, you don't care. You love the sound of your children's voices. You'd rather us sing off key as loud as we can to please you. I pray, Father, keep teaching us what it means to please you. It does bring joy. Thank you for that. Thank you for the peace and joy that comes with focusing on pleasing you. Wake us up, Lord, for ways that we are getting off track and just trying to please ourselves or maybe even somebody else too much. Help us to recognize that, man, uh, joy and peace is not, not what it used to be. Not what it used to be. Lord, grant us repentance. Please bless us now, Lord. Speak to us through your word. Thank you for letting us be part of your church. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I mean, you may be seated. Age three to third grade. Parents, feel free to keep the kids with you if you want. Can you hear me okay? Can you hear me okay? All right, thanks. I accidentally hit a button and I was like, I don't know what just happened. Something might have happened. <laughs> if I were to ask you, who is your, who's your closest friend? Who's your closest friend at the moment? Do you feel love for them? In general, does it show? Why? Are they your closest friend? Did, did you think of somebody? Somebody come to your mind? Why are they your closest friend? What separates them from, from everybody else? So, some people would say, well, so-and-so, they're my closest friend. We've known each other a long time. Oh, so-and-so is my closest friend. I, they know me better than anybody, and I, I know them better than anybody. I can count on them. I love them, and they love me. Now, if you're a guy, that might feel a little strange. You're like, I don't want to use the L word towards my friends, if that's okay with you. We had a little chat yesterday at the men's breakfast. Thanks again to Tom and Ray that put that men's breakfast together. They'll do that once a month. It was, the food was great. Uh, really enjoyed the fellowship, too. I sat next to a guy that I know, but because we had a little bit more time together, I got to know him even better. Uh, and got some of his story, and it was really great. But uh, 
there was a guy, Ray has a friend, and they were like, oh, yeah, we're way past being ashamed of telling each other we love each other. You got a bromance going on? That's what I said. You got a bromance going on? He was like, yeah, we do. <laughs> oh, I heard an amen. That's awesome, yeah? Yeah, I was saying. Yeah, I remember the first time I was on the phone. Where's my wife? Wave. Hi. Um, yeah, I was on the phone with a buddy, and after the phone call ended, I, right as toward the end, I said, hey, I love you. And I hung up, and she was like, <laughs> Who was that? I was like, oh, that's my buddy, whatever. Did you just say I love you? Yeah. What's wrong with that? <laughs> Mind you. <ya. laughs> Guys can do that. I bet I tell a lot of you that I love you, don't I? I tell you I love you. I give you this to sometimes, too. That means I love you in sign language. I tell you I love you. Why would, why would we not? Why would we not? It, it brings even more joy to life when you have close relationships and you, you allow those relationships to be close and you work on those relationships and then you express that affection with each other. There's nothing between you, your closest friend. You would say, there's nothing between us. And, and if there was, then, then we'd work it out because it was worth it. We'd work it out. I might have to forgive them. They might have to forgive me, but we, we would do it. We would do it. It's the kind of relationship that makes, makes life better. You know, again, some of us may be struggling in relationships. We need to make a little bit more of an effort to repair a broken one that meant a lot to us, perhaps. Maybe identify a few close ones that we think we wish it was a little bit closer, but that's going to take a little bit of effort. It's going to take a little bit of vulnerability. And there's really, though, one reason why we're here is for each other, but also because of our relationship with God is the most important, most important. And the immense amount of potential that our relationship with God has. God has feelings for you. We, we don't think about that always. What I was stirring up in you to think about your friend, do you realize that God loves you that much too? He says, I, I love you that much. You know, I, a long time ago when Carmen and I started doing the marriage retreat thing and trying to work on the marriage and figure that out, there was one retreat that we went to that said, intimacy is based on how well you know each other. You're going to, if you want to grow in intimacy, you need to grow in also knowledge of each other, appropriately sharing more and more with each other been married for a long time, you get that. And then you got to have to keep working on it, don't you? Because you change a little bit, your spouse changes, your friend changes, whatever. Time goes on. Something happens, you work through things, and you're like, man, I feel even closer to them. Like, I know them even, even better. God, I can say, oh, God knows everything about me. But I, I think he wants us to tell him about stuff. I think God wants us to tell them how we feel and tell us what we think about and tell them what we're afraid of and as just time goes on so that we know, we know that he knows. And he wants us to know him. He wants us to grow in our knowledge of him. He wants us to understand what it means that he's holy, he's just, he's righteous, he's merciful, he's kind, he's good. He wants us to, to know even more about him. Up to this point in our study of Hebrews, the writer is going to great lengths to, to explain and build this argument, element after element, try to help them em, embrace that a change that, as God, that's, that God has brought about through Jesus. The fulfillment of a promise made to Abraham, the fulfillment of a, prophet, a prophetic psalm about the Messiah and his connection to a priesthood other than the Levitical one, started by Aaron. I heard somebody say once, I really enjoy watching dominoes fall. <laughs> like, can you imagine watching a thousand dominoes fall? You'd be like, oh, that'd be awesome. I don't know how long it would take. Probably just a matter of minutes. I don't know if I'd enjoy it watching them set those things up as much. <laughs> Unless I had an idea, right, of what it would look like when they fell. And then maybe I could enjoy that just a little bit more. 
Uh, there's some parts of Hebrews, and even in the Old Testament, that can be a little tedious. They're, they're building, they got a lot of little details that fit together. But once they tip, it's amazing. It's amazing. The writer in Hebrews is getting to a stopping point where he wants to clarify something, that's a point he's been making. And then he backs it up with another Old Testament reference, and then he makes one more startling summary statement. Can you join me, please? Join me in your Bibles. Hebrews chapter 8. Let's start verse 1. Now the point and what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven, a minister in holy places, in the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, when he says this priest, it does appear that he's talking about Jesus. And so if he says, well, he has to have something to offer, uh, is he being, you know, sarcastic or or rhetorical? Because he just got finished saying in the last section that Jesus offered what? Himself. He offered himself once for all. So is he referencing that or is he drawing yet another comparison, another contrast between the different priesthoods, between the different priests? Listen to the, the rest of this. Let's look at verse 4. And now if he, Jesus, were on earth, he would not be a priest at all. Wow, that's quite a statement. He goes on to say, since there are priests who would who offer gifts according to the law. They have something to offer. They're on earth. But then he says, right here in verse 5, they serve as a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. For when Moses was about to erect the tent or the tabernacle, he was instructed by God saying, see that you make everything according to the pattern that was shown you on the mountain. Now that last phrase is a, a, a paraphrase, but quote of Exodus 25, verse 40. And really, I think what he's doing here is he's showing this, the last section we went over had a lot of contrast. Well, this priest, they, they died, and Jesus didn't die. They had to pass it on. He doesn't have to pass it on. They had to offer offerings. He doesn't. Here, I think the contrast is the former priest carried out their duties on earth. Jesus carries out his duties in heaven. Like, well, some people might say, well, where's Jesus, the Savior? He's in heaven. That's exactly where we need him to be. We need Jesus in heaven before the Father, before, for us. That's where he is. That's where we need him to be. So the earthly priest, the acts, according to this, is just a, just a copy, a shadow, a resemblance, a precursor for something better that God had in mind. And now he's going to go into more detail about the setup of the tent by Moses and what what all that meant in the next chapter, in chapter 9. For now, he's just showing and bringing up just another contrast between the former priest and Jesus. Says the stuff that was on earth was just a copy. Now, in my studies, I came across one quote by John MacArthur. He said, this does not mean that there's actual buildings in heaven, Okay. I'm reading this because I agree, (laughs) which were copied in the tabernacle, but rather that the heavenly realities were adequately symbolized and represented the earthly tabernacle model. Now, I think Solomon knew this. Solomon was the one that God used to actually build the temple. So he built the temple, and they had to make sure that he built it exactly like the tent the tabernacle was. But even he, I think, understood this. Listen to his words in 1 Kings. He says, but will God indeed dwell on earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you. How much less this house that I have built. 
And yet have regard, and yet, and yet have regard to the prayer of your servant and to his plea, O Lord my God, listening to the cry and to the prayer that your servant prays before you this day that your eyes may be open night and day toward this house, the place of which you have said, my name shall be there. God knows we struggle. We have a tendency to live by sight and not by faith. And so here and there, God provides something that we can look at to help us. And then he has to change it because we start to latch on to it too much. Anybody experience that here and there? Throw a little COVID into the mix. <laughs> okay. So he says, this is Solomon again, and listen to the plea of your servant and of your, your people Israel when they pray towards this place and listen in heaven your dwelling place and when you hear, forgive. Forgive. So God, like I said, he gives us object lessons. He gives us metaphors. He gives us things to help us understand, but nothing, nothing quite adequately captures the realities. And so we have to keep that in mind. He says in Hebrews 10, 1, For since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, Make perfect those who draw near. I mean, let me ask you a question. Do you think you might view your sin differently if you were required to bring an animal sacrifice to me on an ongoing basis? You're already going through your mind of just different ways you sin this week and what kind of sacrifice you'd have to bring. You're like, oh my gosh, hey honey, you got to drive the truck to church today. You think it would drive home a little bit the offensiveness of our behavior, the offensiveness of our behavior to God? We might start to realize the seriousness of it. Is it possible that that's one reason why God did this? When He says sin leads to death. And I want you to see what I'm talking about. You deserve it. I'm going to let you take it out on this innocent animal. And we want to turn around and point at God saying, you can't do that. That's wrong. Whoa. (laughs) I'm sorry. Whose universe is this? Clay? Earth and clay? I'm trying to help you understand something that is true and your life is going to be a mess if you don't understand or if you refuse to accept it that your sin is ugly horrendous does that make you feel uncomfortable it would me God sets up his relationship with the children of Israel in a certain way for a certain reason but it was a precursor God had something better planned that he wanted to prepare them for. And this is what he says. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old. As the covenant he mediates is better. Since it is enacted by <clears throat> on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion to look for a second. Now, it's interesting. Now, all of a sudden, he's starting to use this word covenant. Up to this point, he's only used that word once in chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 22, he mentions covenant. And now, in this section that we're covering today, he mentions it seven times. I wonder what he wants to focus on. I wonder what I'm going to focus on if he's going to mention it that many times. But what does it mean? What does covenant mean? Some of you think of your neighborhood, right? You're like, oh, I hate that. I hate the covenant thing. I'm going to blame Satan for that too. He's just ruining a good word. No, but some of us, we would think marriage. Or just in general, right? And just in general, I came across this one quote. It says, most people in our world understand the concept of a meaningful binding agreement. And again, if we want to take that and just and 
with that in mind, but take it up a notch and say covenant, we might think of marriage. You commit yourself to each other. You say vows to each other before witnesses. Okay? Now, some have experienced the heartache of broken vows that damaged or destroyed the relationship and impacted everybody in in just the immediate vicinity. But it's interesting, one thing I came across was the original language, the word used here in the New Testament, and you know, in this scripture and in the New Testament, it isn't the ordinary Greek word for contracts or agreements in which both parties are equal. But rather, the writers of the New Testament chose a less common word which emphasized that the provisions of the covenant were laid down by one of the parties only. Can you imagine that? Imagine going to a wedding <laughs> where only the groom said the vows. And the, and the minister turns to the bride and says, do you believe him? <laughs> if so, say I do. <laughs> You're like, what kind of wedding is this? This is weird. Do you believe him? Will you trust him? As long as you both shall live, I do. Marriage. We have this metaphor given to us by God from the beginning of our existence. Apparently, it's a good one. (laughs) It's a good one. And I think it's interesting how most people still have some sense of what a good marriage is supposed to be. Anybody could criticize, right? Oh, their marriage is awful. Oh, really? Why is that? Because da, 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 da. Oh, they have a great marriage. Why is that? You should get married, but it should like, like, look like this. What are you hoping for? I'm hoping for. We all seem to still have this idea of what a good marriage is. Adultery is not okay. Selfishness is not okay. Instead, a good marriage is characterized by commitment, trust, time, attention, acceptance, intimacy. I mean, if we were just to continue to run with this analogy, this metaphor that God has given to us, let me ask you this. Have you ever thought about your relationship with God in those terms? Are you cheating on God? Are you neglecting your relationship with God? We would say that's not a good marriage. Or maybe you never said, I do. You just wanted to live with God because it was convenient. Not ready to make that commitment yet, but I do want the benefits from it. When things start to go south, then I need to go my way. It's called apostasy. It's in the Bible, too. It shows that you were never married. How about that? At one point in the Old Testament, God had one of his prophets marry an unfaithful woman to prove a point, to drive home a point to the people how they were treating their relationship with him because they did have vows back then. In the Old Covenant, there were vows that God says, I'm going to do this, and you're going to do this. I'm going to do this, and you're going to do this, and this, and this. And there was a lot that they had to keep, a lot of them. And, but they basically proved that if the relationship was going to work, God was going to have to make some promises that he could keep. He was going to have to do some things that we couldn't do for the relationship. He was going to have to help us even do our part. And that's why he says, for he finds fault with them. Not fault with the commands. Not fault with his commands. And, and Paul works on this argument regarding the law in Romans. The fault wasn't God's commands. It was the people who couldn't obey him. And so even he quotes Jeremiah speaking for God. They did not continue or remain faithful to the covenant. Paul talks about this struggle of trying to obey in Romans chapter 7. It wasn't working. It wasn't working. And we need need God to fix it. And guess what? He had a plan. He had a plan. And so the writer, at this point in our text, in Hebrews chapter 8, 
he goes on to quote from Jeremiah to clarify for them God had a plan. He had it ahead of time. And he says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. And so I showed no concern for them, declares the Lord. By this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Hey, know the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. Not only is he repeating the term covenant, but he's referring to it as something new, something better, something new as opposed to something that's old. This is a prophetic message about Christianity, what it means to be a Christian. I mean, you look at just this passage that he brings up from Jeremiah, what exactly did God say he would do under this new covenant? What's different? It would involve a transformation from the inside out to produce true righteousness. There would be personal knowledge, an intimate, an even more intimate relationship with the Lord. Obedience would flow out of love and not just out of compliance. There would be absolute forgiveness of sin, obstacles removed. God is willing to forgive, always always has been. And I I think that's, and and he makes provision for it too. He's willing to forgive, and he's willing to make provision for it. I think that's probably one reason why God is so harsh about unwillingness to forgive. In the Lord's Prayer, right, he says, if you're not willing to forgive, then I'm not going to forgive you because that is completely opposite of my nature. I'm compassionate, I'm merciful, and I'm, I'm telling you to be the same. You must be willing to forgive. If you're unwilling to forgive, that's not like me at all. You might as well just be part from me. But it's hard. Okay. Pray for strength. And, and really, the basis of us forgiving others, right, is his forgiveness for us. And so I would recommend do that. Say, God, please remind me how much you've forgiven me of my sins. Brace yourself. <laughs> Brace yourself. He can remind you of his great grace. And next thing you know, fill you with it where you're like, I could forgive someone else. Their offense to me wasn't anything <laughs> compared to what I've done to God. And so you've got these three promises from God under the new covenant, and I'll mention them in reverse order. I will forgive their sins completely. Like I said, can you imagine if God held a grudge against us? And he says, no, 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 I'm going to forgive their sins completely so that there's nothing hindering our relationship. I will draw them near. They will experience a connecting, intimate relationship with me. I'm going to change their will so that they actually want to do things that please me. They will love me and care about our relationship. I'm going to transform them from the inside out. I will be their God. And they will be my people, he says. Here's a quote I came across. It says, a new situation is in view within the scriptures of the old covenant itself. A situation that envisages, I didn't know if I said that right, envisages a new kind of living, a new spiritual possibility, and a new experience of a definitive forgiveness of sins. The law is internalized and a new intimacy of relationship with God and his people becomes possible. Knowledge of the Lord becomes the possession of all, and the cleansing of sin becomes a reality at the deepest level. A 
Recently, I heard somebody say to me, my sin brought me to God. My sin brought me to God, brought me to my knees, helped me to realize that I needed a Savior who loved me, who loved me. Jeremiah's view is God's people, even though he's looking right at and he's mentioning, it's interesting, you look at the scripture, he first mentions the house of Israel with the house of Judah, because at this point in time, the kingdom was divided. You can find charts online of what king was where, of which kingdom, Israel or Judah, and what prophets were ministering to them. Israel, Jeremiah was on the Judah side, and so he specifically mentions Israel initially with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. And then as he gets further in, he said, he just mentions the house of Israel. At this point, the, God's planning to bring about unity between us and him and us with each other. That's God's desire. That's God's plan, is unity. Division is someone else's agenda. Right? And yet, this is the new covenant, a new relationship God's establishing with new terms, better terms. And so he finishes this section, this chapter, by saying, in speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. I talked to uh, an Orthodox Jew recently, and, and I have to qualify that and say an ex, <laughs> an ex-Orthodox Jew, because he bluntly told me, Jewish movements are a sham. It's false doctrine that's tickling people's ears, making people think that they can actually do something now to please God, and they're falling back under the law. And I'll be honest with you, I hate it. I hate it. Because my Jesus is enough. He is enough. He's enough. And that's what this writer's trying to say. And he can't put it even more bluntly. I mean, even the Ten Commandments that were given to the people are referred to as the, the law of the covenant. The law of the old covenant. And he's saying it's useless. It's not going to save you. It's growing old. It's vanishing away. And this is exactly what Jesus was talking about. Matthew 9, 17. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skins burst, and the wine is spilled, and the, sins are des- the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins, and so both are preserved. Luke 5, 36. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment, and then puts it on an old garment. If he does, he'll tear the new, and and then the piece from the new won't match the old. And then what we heard this morning, likewise he took the cup, and after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Hebrews 9, 15, therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. So he is making the umbrella a little bit bigger at this point in time. He's not just talking about the priesthood. He's trying to share good news and help them to grasp it and embrace it. So was Paul. So was Paul. Oh, I'm pulling a Brian. I sure am. I left my glasses somewhere else. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Do you know Brian and I were born on the same day? We share share the same birthday, November 23rd, some year. (laughs) No, seriously, he and I turned 50 this year. You keep riding your bike, man. I'll wave to you from the sidelines. (laughs) All right, listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who made us sufficient to the ministers, to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. 
For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now if the ministry of death carved in letters of stone, what is he pointing at? Came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? For if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed in its glory. Indeed, in this case, what once had glory has come to no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. For if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. There's that phrase again. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they, re when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil over their hearts, lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. You want to change? Spend time with Jesus. Spend time with Jesus. Listen to him. Let him talk to you. You talk to him. All right, this is what, he, this is what he's given us. Forgiveness of sins. God wants us to believe and experience these truths, these promises, and, I, and that's what I question I have to ask you is, when's the last time that you spent a long time confessing to God? Because I don't know about you, I feel guilty about a lot of stuff. It just creeps up on me. Sometimes I don't realize it. I feel bad about just this and that and the other thing. And yet, the scripture says that I can go to God and have confidence that he will forgive me for every single one of those. Wants me to. Come to him unashamed and say, I've got a ton of things to confess to you, God. And he says, let me have it. Because my son paid for every single one of those. I don't want you to be burdened with those. Why? He paid for those. Get them off your shoulder. Get them off your chest. Talk to me. Matter of fact, I mean, the 12 steps, man, they're trying to get people free from bondage to sin. They recommend confess your faults to God in detail, and then confess it to somebody you trust. Just to help you realize you're done. You're moving forward. You're moving forward. God wants that for us. How about that? Take some time. Go for a walk. Be honest with God. I'm sorry, God. I, I, I'm treating you like you don't even exist. That's what I've been doing. I'm having doubts, and I'm latching on to them. Whatever it is. I guarantee you, you take time to talk honestly with God, he could sort that out. Intimacy with God. Came across the scripture in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 3. It says, if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Known by God. Confession can help with that. And then transformation from within. We are fully known by God, and we know it. We've experienced grace that we didn't deserve. That changes you. That changes you. God's greatest command is that we love him. And I believe God's greatest means to generate true love for him is his grace. I love him because he first loved me. And this is God's offer of relationship to us. 
This is his covenant. Covenant. This is God's marriage proposal to you. Will you say, I do? Or will you just say, I'll think about it? Let's pray. Lord, we needed to know how much sin has cost us, how much sin has hurt you. We needed to know. We needed to know this. Because it's reality. But, and it also makes your grace just seem so much greater, Lord, where you would say, hey, come to me. Come to me. Confess all of your sins. Let me say to you, I forgive you because of Jesus. I forgive you completely. Be in a relationship with me. Trust me with your life. Spend time with me. Let me, let me hear you talk to me. And let me say things to you that you need to hear. Words of love, words of affirmation, words of encouragement, words of correction, admonishment. Lord, thank you, God, for this relationship that you want to have with us. We don't deserve it, and yet you offer it. I don't know how you do it. You, you stir in us love, <laughs> love for you. You did it. You did it. God, you did it. You're bringing about these promises. You're changing us from the inside out. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Sing, then came the morning. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe out of the silence. The roaring lion the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Oh. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. There's salvation in your name, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Sing hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you're my living hope. <laughs> Amen. Come on, give God applause. You know he deserves it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, for today. Oh Lord, we we're encouraged and we're also convicted in some ways too. I pray as we leave this place, would you please continue to minister to us wherever we're at, whatever we're wrestling with. Lord, we pray that we would share our joy with others. We would share this great forgiveness with others, Lord. Give us the moments that we need, God, to confess it all and, and receive and have our joy of our salvation that just that much restored and fanned into flame. Lord, thank you, Jesus. May we have confidence and what you've done, that it covers anything. Thank you for this good news we've been able to talk about. Thank you for this good news we've been able to sing about, Lord. Bring yourself glory in our lives this week. We pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have a great week. It's hard.